I spend my days talking to customers, focusing on the developer experience of how developers build on top of our B2C commerce product. That is Andrew Lawrence, a director of product management here at Salesforce for B2C Commerce. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Andrew about a wide range of topics around B2C commerce, including headless commerce and the upcoming progressive web app, and a lot about what the kind of impact the pandemic has had, both in commerce in general and for developers. But we start, as usual, with his early years. I mean, it's something I got computer when I was a teenager and started writing things on it mm. uh, and making things happen. It was, I mean, this is back, like back in the eighties. So I was writing, you know, basic games that would come up and ask me questions on screen. Right. And you'd type <laughs> questions back and make things happen. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, computers were kind of where I went. There wasn't ever really a thought of doing something else. So like old school Zork style stuff. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. And what was your tech life before Salesforce like? So I worked for a computer building company in the 90s where we built computers, built PCs. And then after school, I went to a company called Tomax here in Salt Lake City, where I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, I built point of sale software. So mm. systems for retailers, all of that. And then Tomax was acquired by Demandware. Mm -hmm. um, and then Demandware was acquired by Salesforce. Gotcha. And I see that was going to be my next question is exactly how did you get introduced to Salesforce? Yeah, yeah, that's it was via acquisition. And, and the interesting thing about it is that since it keeps since Salesforce keeps my original, you know, time that I started at the original company that was acquired, my mm -hmm. my employee record says that I started at Salesforce in February of 1997. <laughs> see, I'm actually a little jealous about that. Because I did not come to Salesforce by way of acquisition. I jumped ship on part of the model crowd. So I jumped ship from model metrics to Salesforce. And then Salesforce bought model metrics like the next year. <laughs> and suddenly all my own coworkers had tenure over me. Yeah. And I'm not bitter about it all. Trust me. Not. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like it. So Okay. Okay. So let's frame things a little bit, talking about B2C commerce and developing on our product and some of the challenges with it. But, but let's start specifically with some of the challenges that we saw recently with the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the pandemic made a big difference with how retailers and, and commerce just started happening in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all aware of things having to move. You have to order things and go pick them up and stores are closing. And so all of these people that were formerly doing, uh, in, in all honesty, some people, some retailers, they're doing commerce. Mm -hmm. primarily out of their stores. And now they move to, well, now we got to completely do it digital. We have to completely build a digital commerce front end, and that needs to be ideal for all of our customers. So it really mm -hmm. exploded. And then companies quickly started pivoting their operating models. They're trying to launch things directly to customers. They're mm -hmm. trying to do curbside pickup. They're trying to do delivery. All of these things that they're all of a sudden trying to do just to keep going through the pandemic. So it's been really interesting to watch how things have shifted over the last nine months. In that last part, I think is really kind of interesting because even on on an e-commerce point of view, probably a lot of stores thought we're going to have to do curbside. Like like that was that like whole new pipelines that had to be put together in order to make that work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you have a lot of retailers who the the idea of having to pick anything up curbside from you know a a craft retailer or from an uh, office supply retailer. I mean, those were things they just didn't bother with before. You went into the store and mm -hmm. picked it up. Well, now you can't even go into the store. So yeah, yeah curbside pickup became a big thing and, and developers are suddenly having to go, they're having their IT departments and their business units coming in and saying, hey, we need to build this. Oh, and we need it running like next week because like all now, of our stores right. are closed. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's how, that's what I was just thinking about. A lot of enterprise cycles, they, they're done, even if we're in an agile mode, but they're still two, three months long. Yeah. And these are changes that need to get out the door immediately or they're just losing revenue. Yep, exactly. That's the way they're going to get, uh, they need to get revenue. The, the stores are shut down. They mm -hmm. need to pull revenue in from as many uh, sources as possible. I mean, I think of the evolution of the food delivery app that we use, and it went from having to like put text into a text field, asking them to leave it outside the door, 
to having the optional checkbox, do you want contact list delivery to the warning box that this will be contactless delivery you have no choice please deal with it there's there is no option b basically yeah yeah and i th- i think that was another piece that kind of with the whole delivery thing also was this this contactless thing i mean mm-hmm. curbside pickup is one thing but curbside pickup where it's just like sitting there and waiting for you to pick it it's a very different thing for a number of different retailers and what they had to pull together yeah. And then we come to just a few weeks ago where people are debating whether or not they're going to even travel for Christmas. What did a what did a pandemic holiday look like for for B2C commerce? Well, I I think we should start for B2C commerce just through the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um we've seen major spikes like we were, we were seeing numbers that were just huge that kind of looked similar to holiday 2019. Mm just during the pandemic at different points in time. So it mm. it kind of upended things there. And then once we got to the holidays, it was really interesting to see how much shopping shifted mm. uh, into e-commerce. So we saw, like, uh, if we just take Cyber Week as an example, yeah, our commerce platform itself saw an increase of about 50% growth just in overall sales wow. and like 80% in page views from just, this is just from one year to the next. I mean, we're essentially seeing, you know, 50, 70, 80% increase on these things to the platform. Mm. Um, and it was really amazing to see. Nice. Well, I mean, <laughs> amazing. I think actually your word is probably more approved than nice on it. Okay, so we have more people online. We have more avenues to storefronts, more interaction points, much more traffic, not just the holiday, but leading up to it. So let's talk about some of the tools on Commerce Cloud that we're using to help build these solutions. And first, let's just kind of frame the concept in general. Like, give me the elevator pitch for headless commerce. Uh, I think the elevator pitch for headless commerce is really about exposing APIs and making it so that your developers mm-hmm. can build commerce experiences that they want to on their own timelines and using their own mechanisms to do it. Mm-hmm. So now they're building directly against the APIs. They're using agile processes and, and modern technologies to present these experiences to their consumers, whether they are the full storefront that's like running when you go to that website in your browser on your computer, Mm -hmm. whether it's a mobile application that they're building to run on your phone, whether it's an app to run in uh, like a Google voice assistant or, Mm -hmm. you know, voice assisted shopping. All of those are things that now with with providing APIs that you can do commerce experience. Now you open up all these possibilities for experiences. Gotcha. So if I, if I have to add that, allow contactless delivery, you're exposing, like I'm talking to the same endpoints to get that done and then just transferring it to the different clients that, I, that I'm going to be exposing to my users. Yeah, yeah. And, and giving them the flexibility of, of where they need to do that. I mean, with retail and with commerce, it's, it's amazing how many systems may come into play just from a simple commerce transaction, right? I mean, if you think mm-hmm. about just a simple commerce transaction where you go online, you order one thing, you put it in your basket, you say that I would like to have it delivered at this day, um, and that's it, and then you pay for it. There mm-hmm. are so many systems that come into play, weaving all of that stuff together. And so making APIs available to make it easier to weave pieces together is what yeah. Headless is really all about. And, and talk to me just a little bit about scale since that's a real it's a real power of our cloud like when we're talking about all of these spikes and overall traffic like how easily did our b2c apis scale to that demand we we actually did really well so during okay. uh, back to cyber week last year we saw there was like a 50 percent increase in just the amount of apis mm-hmm. coming in uh, we essentially saw just during cyber week we saw about a billion api calls come into the platform Mm-hmm. to be able to do what was needed. And and, and all, being able to do all of that with kind of a trust and scale and performance. I mean, at Salesforce, we say that trust is our number one value, and it, it really yeah. has to be to be able to support that kind of scale. It's all hands on deck to focus, but also a lot of thought and process on how to get things ready for those type of environments. Gotcha. Any, any interesting shopping trends that you saw over this particular holiday? Any, any what, you know, favorite items that were fl- flying around? 
Yeah, I mean, we can we can see a number of items that were uh, out there and listed. We saw lots of things for uh, soap. So, <laughs> well, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, yeah, the, sure. the kind of things that you would think from the pandemic. Mm-hmm. We've seen lots of searches for soap and sanitizer. We saw lots of searches over the holiday for PS5s and the of new course. Xbox. Um, yeah. So yeah, the kind of the kind of things you would you would think. Although yeah. I would I would admit that like toilet paper and stuff was in there in 2019 <laughs> I would not have thought that toilet paper that would that would have been, have been yeah exactly thing, yeah. and and I have to say I think I'm guilty of most of those so I, was, <laughs> I think I think I think it was part of your traffic spike there okay so let's talk breaking down the API but actually APIs how many different APIs are we talking about here uh, for us we have uh, currently listed out on a developer site there are 19 different APIs. Oh, wow. Um, but the APIs inside each API, they have a, a varying number of endpoints. So there's there's okay. a, f- a few, you know, somewhere between 100 and uh, 200 endpoints mm-hmm. for getting into the system. Yeah. And did we construct any new APIs recently, either because it was on your roadmap or because we decided these needed to be added in because of the, the demands of the pandemic? Yeah. So th- the interesting thing is kind of how things fortuitously came together. So uh, mm. we had been making kind of a shift to get more focused on headless and get more focused on being API first, meaning thinking about the APIs as being the primary thing that we build first and then we build things on top of them. Mm-hmm. We had efforts around that starting at the beginning of 2019. Nice. And had been building up a number of things and getting ready for a new API platform that we were going to be introducing in the late summer of, of this, of, well, I was going to say this year, but now it's last year, <laughs> 2020. Right. 2021, yeah. So we we were gearing up for that. And then the pandemic started, you know, in March, April, May. Yeah. And it became even more obvious that this was going to be even more important. So we, we did get this new API platform out mm-hmm. um, and available in uh, August of last year. Gotcha. And it's been it's been great to see adoption and see customers and what they're trying to do on top of that platform. Got it. So let's let's talk a little bit more about that. You've got a lot of APIs, a lot of endpoints, a lot of different options. How is a developer able to navigate all of that? So we we had a few things that we need to do. We we've had APIs for a while for B2C commerce. Um they've been out there and available. They haven't really been documented super well, um, mm. and they, they've been a little bit cumbersome. There was even a period of time where we had the documentation for them uh, behind uh, authentication. Like, you couldn't actually see the documentation if you weren't already a customer of BBC mm. Commerce. Mm-hmm. We knew that in introducing these new APIs that that couldn't continue. We needed a, a better place to make them available and make them available publicly. So okay. we... We kind of lever. We partnered actually with MuleSoft inside of Salesforce, and we oh. created a uh, what's called our Commerce Cloud Developer Center, which you can get to if you go to developer.commercecloud.com. You'll find it, and that's where okay. we posted all the information about the APIs. You can see all the details for every single endpoint and what it looks like. And there's a mocking service there. You can send an example request and see what the example response will be. Uh-huh. And getting all of that became just as important as making the APIs themselves. So so I want to touch on that one point that you just mentioned, because I feel like in the community, there's the, the belief that you're, you're only a commerce developer once you have to be one. And what's if I'm not a customer of Commerce Cloud, What's the developer experience like for me? How much can I really kick the tires? Yeah, out in the developer center, you can go through all of the APIs and you can see them. You can see the responses, uh, uh, the requests and responses with the mocking service. Uh-huh. You can interact with them. I'll admit at the moment right now to actually get a sandbox uh, running for Commerce Cloud, that is still sandboxes are for existing customers, but we will mm-hmm. have some trial sandbox options uh, mm-hmm. coming up here in the next couple of months. Gotcha. Um, so to get directly to sandbox access, uh, it is still closed off a little bit, but the public availability of all the documentation is out there and available, and you can look through it and and use the mocking service and see what's there. Yeah, and so tell me a little bit more about the mocking service, because it sounds like if I'm not a customer, I could still like 
tinker around with the JavaScript client, some Node.js, and at least be able to say, hey, I need these three actions in order to do cart fulfillment, and Commerce Cloud can definitely do that for me. Yeah, you could you could see those details that are there. Uh, and, and you mentioned, actually, one thing I forgot is there's there's a new SDK that's out there and available also connected okay. to the APIs. And the okay. SDK itself is completely open source. So you can find the SDK in GitHub. You can see all the details in there. You can download it, bring it into your your builds and your environments and experiment with it. And then once you do get a sandbox, then you're ready to just rock and roll. You're just ready to roll. Yep. Yeah. T- tell me a little bit more about the SDK. Is it like, is it JavaScript only? Like, what's the technical hinge points there? Yeah, it, it, it's a Node.js SDK. Okay. So built, it has, uh, for B2C Commerce, we, we kind of classify our APIs in two different modes. There are shopper APIs and there mm-hmm. are administration APIs. You can kind of think of it in two different mm-hmm. ways. A, sh- a shopper-based API is an API that w- you will interact with from your storefront. So the authentication into it is, you know, the guy at home at his computer who's logged in, you know, wearing his pajamas put yeah. in his user and password, it's his authentication to get in and use those APIs. Whereas Got the it. administration APIs are meant for employees of the retailer, whomever it is that's Got using it. it. So okay. both of those APIs are exposed in the SDK, mm-hmm. um, and it's all Node.js based to get in and use it. Okay, so it does like, some of the lovely things, like reduces those REST API endpoints down to objects and lets me do all the nice transactional stuff in Node. Yep, correct. And it has uh, some of the authentication pieces that are kind of built in to give you some helpers there. There's some low-level caching that it does to assist with some of the performance items. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice, nice. Cool. So what about the community aspects of the Developer Center? If I'm looking to reach out to other commerce developers and, you know, have a forum for their, what what, uh, what kind of features are there? Yeah, out on the communities, uh, it's, it's built up. There are a number of forums that are out there available right now. Mm-hmm. We have over 7,000 registered users of the, of the Developer Center right now. So there's a mm-hmm. lot of people that can see and ask questions and, and more importantly, answer questions. So yeah, there's there's a great community out there of places where you can go and just get information and ask your questions about B2C Commerce in general, not only for these new APIs, but even Mm -hmm. for other things that we have available for B2C Commerce. Got it. And and of course, I I assume there's some kind of trailhead love out there. And there are trailhead links as well. Yes, brilliant segue. But of course, nothing (laughs) would be nothing would be complete without putting some things in trailhead. So there are a number of trails for. Um, just building on top of BDC Commerce in general, but there are also yeah. trails specifically around headless and how to do some of the headless things there. And gotcha. all of those you can find links to on the Developer Center. So I know this is picking of your favorite children, but do you have a favorite API? Do I have a favorite API? <laughs> that's a, that's an odd question. I mean, it it, when, it, when it comes to commerce, really the favorite of the APIs is just getting product information. Uh, I okay. am I am still surprised. I've been doing retail and commerce for over 20 years now, and I am still surprised at the type of information that some retailers want to store with their items. Oh. Um, whether, I mean, every, every, like, fashion retailers have, like, you know, size and color and those type of things. But sure. Um, sometimes they store details related to uh you know materials that made up things or okay um, or or fashion groups that make up things and just the data that you can get on a product is always fascinating what what they feel is going to be selling yeah, what, to the what customer they feel is not and sometimes not even important to the customer it's just data they need for segmentation or whatever they're doing but uh, yeah there's just all sorts of data that they connect to their products you know that's that's funny because i used to work uh back when i was in like a dot com consultancy and we were doing a lot of e shops and stuff like that and and the joke around the the shop was that we just sell ball bearings right like it's like we we we're doing the same thing over and over again and so to us it's just like ball bearings but to the actual customer i suppose it gets a lot more distinct and detailed yeah. than that yeah there, there's always a root of that that i mean you're still just selling things and taking credit card payment and doing it but the nuance to everything no cust no two customers are ever the same gotcha gotcha okay well through the magic of podcast time travel by the time this airs you will have already been on readiness release live can you can you give me just kind of like the the quick overview of some of the demo magic that you were showing there 
Yeah, so in, in the release rating is live, we go through a general kind of overview of these new APIs and what they're doing and kind of our philosophy for headless commerce mm-hmm. uh, as a whole, where, I mean, we see headless commerce as a, a piece and an opening to what you can do, but the, our commerce, our B2C commerce platform that we have is really about giving developers the flexibility to do what they want. If you want to deliver a modern experience and what's there, you can, and if you want to deploy your comments anywhere, you can as well. And then when we get to the demo that we'll have in our uh, in release readiness live, we have built a we quickly built a, a Google Voice Assistant application. Oh, cool! Connected it to the SDK mm-hmm. and started doing you know shopping from a Google Voice Assistant, looking for items, finding items, getting details about items. Got it. Um, and and the reality is. It took me longer to record the demo and get through all of that than it took for the developer to actually build it. Uh, so, 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 quick ballpark: how how quickly did the de- developer actually build it? Uh, it was they had built a number of things. Admittedly, they were already familiar with Google, but sure. it was it was really just an afternoon. In the oh morning. wow. Wow. And I am still looking for this term and I will invite my audience to give it to me if, if, I, if somebody came up with a good one. But there is I feel like there should be a term for the amount of time it took in order to create a, a, a the same amount of, t- of content. Right. So like five minutes on readiness release live could take x number of hours to actually execute on <laughs> yeah 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 and the, and the ratio is probably much higher than anybody would think is it, it, it is actually <laughs> rational and, <laughs> and i will point to the 10 minutes it will sometimes take me to do a 30 second bumper so it's <laughs> well I, I guess welcome to the new normal <laughs> since we're all yeah. recording video and audio these days it, exactly <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so moving on to some of the new stuff, uh, give me the elevator pitch for the omni-channel inventory microservice because boy, that's a lot of nouns. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, our, our new omni-channel inventory <laughs> microservice is coming in the spring twenty twenty one release. It's mm-hmm. really a new API service that can provide kind of a single source of truth for okay. your location level inventory across multiple channels and you can like group them together and it's really about being able to give a quick real-time inf- inventory information so okay. that you can more easily do things like you know pick up from store and those type of omni-channel interactions um, inventory is this fascinating thing that i've seen over the years that the, the the idea of real time inventory is always this elusive unicorn mm. that's out there that people are trying to chase. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, when you when you go shop online and if it tells you that we still have you know three available, how mm-hmm. they got to that three number can be multiple systems and multiple hops, and then there's probably a number yeah. of buffers that they put into place. They may actually have ten, but they don't quite trust that. Yeah. Um, so they said there's only three. So all of these things that go in, and this new service is uh, built super fast, built on Salesforce platform, and giving you the ability to get that inventory at massive scale and then manage it from there. Yeah. No. That that brings to uh, an interview which we'll have aired by the time this airs, but has not come out yet, uh, with Abraham David Lloyd, and we're talking about BSC architecture, and the problem of failed carts, right? Like not having a cart conversion. So if if you put three items into something, and then I put three items in my cart, and then I walk away from my cart, and I never go again, n- never come back again, is that six items in the cart? Or is it really three? Because you're an active user, and you're going to go purchase them. Um, yeah, inventory, inventories, and then and then bring a st- bring a physical store into that. I know mm, I know mm-hmm. we're kind of reduced in what we're doing in stores right now, but bring yeah. a physical store into it where you want to sell the item that is sitting out in a store. You want this person to be able to go pick it up, but uh, if it says there's one left, there is no guarantee. First of all, that's you have to. Be, have great trust in the people actually counting inventory in the store. <laughs> right. And and the right. second is you have to have trust that uh, it may be in the store, but it may be sitting in somebody's shopping cart right this moment. Right. And how do you know if you're going, if it's okay to sell it to you or not? 
right? I hadn't even factored in because you have breakage and theft yeah. and things that are are not recorded either accidentally or sometimes, you know, in, intentionally through malicious reasons or something like that. And so, yeah, does does the storefront actually know that it's actually there? Yeah, and the, and the, the biggest thing to be able to get around these is to be able to update those numbers just as often as possible. Yeah. Um, and this service can, can help with that. Can help with that. So I, I really appreciate that in part because I cannot say how many times as a consultant I would stare my client in the eyes and just, just ask them, when you say real time, do you actually mean real time? Or is a five second delay okay? Or is a is a one minute delay okay? Like what's what do you you know, when you say you want this right away, like what do you actually mean? And I feel like this is one of the rare use cases I've heard where there's justification like from one end to the other to get that information as accurately as possible, as quickly as possible. Yeah, exactly. For for being able to because there's nothing worse for a retailer than selling something to a customer and having to essentially tell them, I'm sorry, we actually don't have it. We and actually don't. Yeah. That's the worst customer experience yeah. that they can give. So they take all these measures to make sure that that doesn't happen. Cool. Um, sounds like a really cool product. So let's talk roadmap wise, because I don't know if many people are familiar with a recent purchase that has occurred. Uh, we've re we've recently added Mobify to our family. What is Mobify and what are they going to bring to Commerce Club? Yeah, great, great question. So we did, we made a recent acquisition of uh, the company called Mobify back in October. Mm -hmm. Mobify is a front end as a service offering that they make for, to run storefronts for customers. So if you're, if you're building a headless storefront, mm -hmm. you're building the front end web UI and you're connecting it to something where that's operating the server piece and where that's happening. And then you're connecting to APIs. Mm -hmm. Where that storefront is actually running, you often, you either host yourself, like mm -hmm. you run it out of AWS or GCP or something like that. And then you yeah. have to manage all the stuff that goes with it. Like yep. it has to have a CDN in front of it. You're going to have to do load balancing. You're going to have to do, you know, a disaster recovery, all those things you're going to have to manage yourself. Yeah. Mobify basically gives you a managed runtime environment that we will run for you, but you still have full control of the environment and can do the types of things that you want to build a storefront. And at the same time, Mobify has a progressive web app that can be a starting point for your headless storefront that you're trying to build. So okay. it's kind of two that we got two pieces out of the acquisition. The one we're calling the, the PWA kit, the progressive uh -huh. web app. That's, that's the uh, kit that you can use as kind of a starting launching point to get up there. Okay. And then the managed runtime is the environment that we'll give you so that you have a place to run these storefront environments. So, so let's, let's break that down a little bit, starting with that first part so one of the things I do like is that the, so this kind of leans into what you were talking about before with like commerce anywhere because you're giving easy access to something that can be both desktop and mobile at the flip of a switch. Right, right. Okay. Um, and then what is what does that kit look like? Are you is it like a series of templates that somebody without coding experience can kind of tinker with, or is this something leaning towards the JavaScript CSS developer? No, it is it is definitely leaning towards the developer. So it's okay. built it's built using Node.js and React. Got it. Um, so it's a it's a React front end to build this this PWA storefront that's operational there so there there are templates in terms of like code templates and things uh -huh. that are there and it's it's laid out so that you can connect in uh like if you have a third-party content management system you can mm, connect that okay. in for bringing things up but it's so it's definitely code gotcha um, but it's kind of standard code that most developers nowadays know how to do a, a modern standard storefront starter yep. kit for somebody in the Re in the react family of things exactly Gotcha. And then when it comes to that managed runtime, is that like, so that's like a machine image where I can kind of kick the tires of my progressive storefront before throwing it against the pure power of the B2C APIs? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really about running the storefront in, in an environment. So it, okay. the, our managed runtime is it's running on top of AWS. Got it. Um, and then you can fire up instances Mm, okay. um, to test things and then and then point instances to or point production to given instances that are Got up and running. Nice. So so that sounds like it's a really nice companion to all the stuff that we were talking about earlier in the episode where it's like 
you're giving APIs for flexibility and agility and getting things done fast. And now if you don't have that client that you don't have that starting point for that client, well, you're not going to have that excuse anymore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so what we were starting to see with with people as we were doing initial headless, our headless work back in the beginning of 2019 and moving in through and talking with customers and partners, what they were trying to build, we'd have many customers that would come and say that, hey, I want to build a headless storefront. And we'd have longer, deeper conversations with them. And, and they were talking about building a React app or, or a Vue app or those type of things to run their storefront. And then we get talking about, okay, so you're going to run it, right? You're going to host something in AWS and and build a CDN and all that stuff. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Yeah. We just, we just want to build this storefront. We're like, oh, okay, all right. There's a piece missing here that we probably need to get to more people so that we have a place where they can go deploy and run these things and let Salesforce manage it, which is what they're paying Got us it. for. Right. They're, they're, they're like, no, we want you to manage that. Yeah. Well, okay. We needed something to do that. <laughs> Got it. Um, and all things being Salesforce, I'm just going to take a take a guess here that maybe Mobify won't be called Mobify in a few months. Uh, that's correct. <laughs> it, it, it won't. So there are two pieces to it. There is the PWA kit. So there's the B2C commerce PWA kit Got and it. the B2C commerce managed runtime. Um, Got and those both things will become available. Initial betas will begin in April. Uh, the nice. GA should start sometime in the summer. And the most important thing is that if you, these are not additional licensing things for B2C commerce. So oh, nice. if you have B2C commerce, these are both things that will be made available for you to use if you desire to do so. All hail the Zero Dos Q. That's right. <laughs> um, and folks should know that we I've already started talking to some of the folks from Mobify. We will definitely have a follow-up episode to talk more details about those kits coming out. And that's our show. Now, we will have in the show notes of this episode links to the various resources we were talking about, including the new commerce developer portal, a trailhead on using those progressive web apps, and the wonderful readiness to release live video. Now, before we go, I did ask after Andrew's favorite non-technical hobby. And I got to say, gang, I think we might have to have a contest at some point as to which one of these answers is the most adorable. Uh, if if you could see, I don't you probably can't see and nobody else can either, but I have a <laughs> wide collection of uh, Lego Star Wars and other Lego nice. kits that I like to put together. Nice. I think the other piece is... This is more my wife's hobby, but I like okay. riding along. She recently bought a Jeep. Oh. And uh, so the I, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and not uh-huh. far from many Jeep trails and that. And so uh. that's that's become her new hobby, and I like sitting in the passenger seat. I want to thank Andrew for the great conversation and information, and as always, I want to thank you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this show, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes and transcripts, and have links to your favorite podcast service. And by the way, if you happen to like Fortnite, you can catch me playing nearly every Thursday at 5 o'clock central when I play with fellow Salesforce employees and a few people from the community in order to raise money for Extra Life. My twitch.tv user ID is simply Josh Burke, and you can find me there. Thanks again, everybody, and I'll talk to you next week.